when you are done, because I'm told it also affects uh, the, 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 the process. Committee Secretary has not uh, muted himself. In welcoming everybody in today's meeting, which is a very important meeting, welcome uh, Honorable Minister and your deputy and the staff that you are leading. It is a meeting which is of public interest, I will say, because members who may have observed that uh, UIF has always been on the, on the news on a number of issues that have been raised in terms of fraud and people that are complaining. We then, uh, as, as, the, as, as, the, as the committee section led by the chair, we then saw it fit that, that we have a week uh, which we don't have anything. Why don't we apply for a special sitting, which is today? So, in it, Honorable Minister, I, I, I hope that uh, the department is, is ready and is then going to be able to, to take us through. As I've said, uh, it's, this is of national interest. And if then, as you have said initially, when this whole uh, process started, that obviously we will be the system, there will be people who would like to take chances. So it has been, can I say, those people have been exposed in terms of the media, but we can't be told by the media of what is happening in the, in the, in the, in the department. We are to be told by, by yourself as the, as the political head of the department. I'm not going to waste time and welcome Honorable Chai, who is the chair of the, of the select committee and the team that he is leading, and all people that are here. Yes, we will be sensitive in wanting to know who is here, but we must remember that uh, this is an open session of the, of the committee, select, but committee at least we just, just, just to know that who is, who is here. All so I hope that that comrades won't take, an, yes, people won't take an offense when we are asking who is, who is here, here because even remember, in the committee, people, they do introduce themselves, but now session, we'll be assisted by the secretariat in telling us we who is, is here. Just to know that Having who said who that, here, I will so then hand over to people won't take an offense. Before we allow when we start to take us here, because even in the I will then they do introduce the, themselves, with, but now Zolani, assistant, who is here and, 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 and who is not here. Yes, yes. Then after that, we'll hand that over to the minister, and, and then the minister will, will then indicate who's going to leave the, 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 the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, Minister. Good morning, the honorable members. Chair, I have from the NA Portfolio Committee. I've got yourself, Chair Honorable Dunja. I've got Honorable Mdabe, Honorable Zuma, Honorable Kabane, Honorable Jenner, Honorable Nonsele, Honorable Kado, Honorable Baker, and so far, Chair. Those are the members that I have reported now. And also, we have Honorable Hendricks, who is from Al Jama, who is an alternate party member of the committee. And uh, I also did receive an a uh, an apology from Honorable Nkanguini from the EFF, who did mention that somebody will be coming, another member will be coming in the, on her behalf. Um, from, oh, Honorable Chwaku. Okay. And then, Chair, I also have um, Honorable Yinana did mention that he will be attending, but he will leave it at one. Yeah. But I haven't seen him yet. Um, on the wow. chair. From the admin oh, chair, I've got Trump. myself. Okay. I've got the and then chair. A substitute have, of course, um, yeah, Mr. Mvaba. Um, Honorable well, Yinana did mention that he will be I attending, but he will leave it at and one. And but I haven't seen him. Um, um, the 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 from the admin chair, I've got myself. I've got the and then chair. A substitute of course, yeah, Mr. 
from the officials we have Lutu Mosishuba, the content advisor, Matia Solomon, the secretary, and Enrico, the committee assistant. So far, we have not received the apologies. Thank you, Chairperson. No, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Tinizo. I would have thought that uh, the, the Secretariat will have received the apology from the DG. I didn't hear him, uh, the Secretariat, reading that apology. Oh, I'm but, sorry. Uh, Okay, so we've got an apology from the uh, from the DG of Employment and Labour. Yes. Over to you, Minister. Honourable Nasi. Uh, over you. to you. Thank you, thank you, Honour Honourable Chair of the Portfolio Committee and Chair of the Select Committee and and the members of both committees. Um, the deputy minister and the officials of the department, uh, the commissioner and the management uh, of the UIF and members of the media. And ladies and gentlemen, um, you correct, Chairperson, the DG um, is off sick. Um, he, had to, he, can't, he can't make it. He, I couldn't hear his voice this morning. And thank you, Chair, for the opportunity. In summary to date, since the start of the lockdown, the UIF, because I think I must give this context, uh, it has distributed 28 billion in COVID-19 test benefits, covering 520,000 uh, employers, providing income support to nearly over 6 million um, laid-off workers. Uh, the scale of support is unprecedented. There were certainly challenges and delays as we developed the appropriate policies and directions, which called on the UIF um, to be completely repurposed to meet the new mandate, in turn necessitating the changes to processes, procedures, and systems which were never designed for the scale of the operation. Well, with the announcement of the state of the national disaster in the face of the pandemic, the beginning of the lockdown and the call from the president to mobilize social solidarity, this required a massive uh, and a targeted response from the UIF uh, to support the late of workers and even uh, those whose employers had not registered uh, for UIF. But remember that uh, no insurance company anywhere in the world uh, pays out to non-contributing beneficiaries. But that is what the crisis required. We needed to rapidly put in place policy and directions which would guide, uh, which would guide the the. the UIF and the beneficiaries to access this particular benefit. And all these directives or directions and amendments were developed through the network with the social partners and presented to the net joints and uh, the cabinet. So the COVID-19 tariff benefit direction appealed to employers to apply on behalf of their employees who were temporarily laid off. Following complaints from the workers that some employers were not coming to the party, the direction was amended to compel employers to apply on behalf of their employees. A second amendment provided for topping up in order to maximize the benefit. 
a third amendment in response to the legal challenges for excluding certain categories of workers required a clear and expanded definition of the term work of the term work and the covid benefits necessitated not only new policies and direction but also a major system change to cope with the tenfold increase in the benefit payment and prior to the lockdown the UIF paid benefits only to retrenched workers who had contributed to the fund the process was typically initiated by the individual walk ins to the labor centers this all had to change we developed i mean we developed automated online applications in order to avoid further spread of the virus from the mass queuing at the labor centers um at the same time we engaged with the business and labor in netlek to make possible bulk disbursement of the benefits via the employers and the bargaining councils it was this agreement which allowed us to provide the benefit payments on the massive scale but yes it was a learning curve and there were delays as we sought to repurpose the uif and augment the systems further delays occurred in may when we picked up instances of employers who had received funds from the uif but failed to pay their employees which uh, meant we we had to make changes to allow uh, direct payments to employees and let's be clear honorable members the uif is not some money uh, or some money hanging in the tree with unlimited resources so as we repurposed the fund to deliver to laid off workers we also needed to build build in the necessary uh, financial controls and ensure the liquidity and the long term sustainability of the fund itself i said at the time we don't start paying out benefits before controls are in pay, in place again further delays but i believe this was necessary although the constituencies both labor and the employers they were very impatient about, i mean uh, impatient about how we were dealing with the things they were saying we were delaying and so on but the issue was the controls and i need to flag that from the start the uif was wide awake to the risks of fraud with the new covid benefit system especially given the large sums involved <laughs> and uh, they will tell you of the strategy which was developed to follow the money and that we budgeted for a complete audit to account for every cent paid out even if it's going to take very long but we will have to follow that money we will have to 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 audit every cent which has gone out we also made this very clear to the employers in our network and engagement as well as um, in the directions which we issued out we said we will support you and your workers but when this is over you will be audited if some if some of um, the transactions uh, needs forensic we are ready for that but before we get there let me let me list some of the controls put in place the use of the reference and id numbers to prevent duplicate payments the verification of the banking details password protection and checking claims against the uif and sars uh, databases the uif has also engaged in independent external experts to assist in particular a property company to carry out data analy- i mean analytics uh, on all suspicious transactions to identify fraud with the very fast turnaround time of 10 days in addition to this the ag a month ago agreed to conduct an interim audit probing um probing the issued directions processes and documentation in, in preparation 
to their audit of COVID-19 benefits payment. And I also need to flag the work of the UIF internal audit and its risk, anti-corruption and integrity management unit. To date, 75 cases of suspicious transactions have been identified. 16 investigations have been finalized with two criminal cases instituted with 59 cases still under investigations. And I think the commissioner might say more on that. Recent cases which featured in the media are a reassuring indication that fraud will not go undetected and that the UIF systems and controls are working. Of course, there is no room for complacency. And in the light of these breaches, the UIF has further strengthened the controls, including controls over change of the passwords and banking details, enhancing capacity to trace the IP addresses as part of the audit trail, the appointment of the forensic specialist to trace the fraud, the weekly meetings with the Hawks uh, COVID-19 investigation unit and discussions with the banks to establish early warning systems. Control measures are constantly reviewed and strengthened. We are determined that theft from the state and from laid off workers will not go unpunished. As I indicated, the UAF is not a money tree and that we have a duty to safeguard the workers' money. First, in relation to the liquidity of the fund, I can assure the committee that the UIF will honor the commitment to pay special COVID test benefits for three months, with June being uh, the last of these payments. And um, let me further clarify, very outstanding claims for the three months will be honored. Remember that um, when we're dealing with the individuals, who some of them could not be able to have uh, access to um, uh, to the issue of the computers and the uh, electronics we had to, and the whole technology. We have to deal with those people. And some of them, their employers did not uh, cooperate. So in terms of the longer term sustainability of the fund, I receive regular reports from the UIF board based on continuous monitoring by the actuaries to ensure that the fund is in a position to meet its obligations to the UIF contributors. In conclusion, Chairperson, I take uh, the following lessons from the, from the last three months. First, that as government, we deliver when we work in cooperation with the social partners, that's labor and business. This was critical in repurposing of the UIF to meet the crisis of the lockdown layoffs. And it will be important as we mop up the incidents of fraud and corruption. Second, I'm greatly encouraged by the capacity of the UIF to pick up on suspicious transactions, as well as the very prompt response and support of the law enforcement. Of course, there will be, there will be some leakages, which you might not be able to see, but some people as we do that follow-up, we'll be able to see that. Last, gaps in the social security and unemployment insurance provision have been highlighted during the lockdown. We have started to address some of these in relation to the domestic workers and the foreign nationals. Also, giving a break to unregistered employers and their employees on condition that they register for UIF. They contribute and repay the past debts. Finally, I wish to acknowledge the support amongst others of SARS in conducting prompt verification in order for UIF to finalize payment, as well as Home Affairs in validating the IDs and status of the foreign national workers, many of whom have contributed uh, to UIF for years and I'm talking those who have been employed legally, not the illegal ones. Also to Harambe Unemployed Youth Accelerator for providing us with the call center services, which were a key in responding to the queries of both the employees and the employers. Uh, 
thank you very much, Chairperson. I think that the Commissioner is ready now. Uh, thank you very much, Honourable Minister. Can we then hand over to the Commissioner? Commissioner, are you ready? Uh, I'm, I'm ready, Chair. Good afternoon, <coughs> uh, Honourable Chairperson of Portfolio Committee and the Honourable uh, Chairperson of the Select Committee. Uh, volume uh, must born. Volume must born. Volume. Is that better, Chair? Speak up. Okay, Mr. Sure. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Sorry, Chair Person. Uh, Chair and members, uh, I'm accompanied by the, uh, the URF Chief Operations Officer and the URF Chief Risk Officer. The intention to have these two chair is just for them to give us um, uh, granular details on some of the investigation cases and also some of the controls that the COO has put in place. I, I think that the minister has covered the majority of the presentation, so I'm just going to shoot straight on those areas where I'm just lifting up <coughs> certain areas uh, that the minister at his level uh, left out. Uh, chair, let me just go to as well in the presentation, if, if members, I just take you to slide 13, uh, just to assure members that we have already started paying uh, directly to uh, employees. And it, here it's shown that we've almost paid a billion rands to employees. Over 207,000 employees has been paid as we pay directly to them when the company apply on their behalf. <coughs> Uh, we've also supported the most vulnerable in our society, which is the domestic workers. We've already paid 128 million rands for over 35,000 domestic workers. And the, the one that was a thorny issue, I think the minister has touched on, is that of the foreign nationals. We've, we've, we've paid them over more than half a billion rands, at 693 million rands for 171,000 foreign nationals. As the minister touched on earlier, Chair, and members, the, the key driver behind us paying these foreign nationals was the use of um, uh, SARS and then plus our <coughs> our home, home affairs to confirm the availability of, of the data. If you go to slide 14, Chair, I'm just giving here a breakdown of which industry have enjoyed or, or seems to have suffered during the, the, the COVID-19 lockdown you can see that the personnel services has suffered the most. In the main, in the personnel services, these are your boarding houses, your cafes, restaurants, laundries, beauty shops, uh, funeral undertaking, cemetery, and advertising agents and collecting agents. So you can see where human beings are involved, whether they have to go and do their hair, they need to go and sleep over. They've suffered the most. And hence, we've paid most of the money there. And then the trade. <coughs> And then here in the trade, you have your game, poultry, fish, game dealers, installers, assemblers, and computer uh, co com computer installers. You also have photographers that are sitting in the trade. Now, these are the two uh, areas that have suffered the most during the COVID, or have claimed the most from UIF. If you go to the next slide, Chair, this is just a slide showing the areas where there have been list claims. Uh, with the list one being banking, if you go to slide 15, uh, will you learn? Uh, banking and textile being the uh, among the top 10 list uh, com uh, areas or the sectors that has claimed for URF. And then if you go to slide uh, 16, will you learn? On slide 16, what we are reflecting here, Chair, is just a breakdown just for members to have a feel of the distribution of uh, the 27 billion rands across the province. Uh, topping these provinces, of course, is Gauteng at 12.9 billion rands, followed uh, by Western Cape at 4.4, and number three is KZN at just over 4 billion rands, and then followed by Eastern Cape and, 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 and Mpumalanga. Then the other provinces, they just make it just below a billion rand. So some of the provinces we didn't encounter a huge claims. 
or which may be a reflection that their head of, their head offices are either based in Houten or Western Cape or KZN. And then in, in the next slide, it is just a, a feel of what we've done for the foreign nationals, but the minister did touch on this. So I'll skip slide 17, Chair. And then go straight to slide 19, Chair, just to assure members that to, during uh, during the, the payment of COVID-19 tells, we continued as UIF to pay slide 19 tells. We continue to pay ordinary benefits to ordinary South Africans. As you can see, we've paid over 500 and 8,000 UIF beneficiaries during this lockdown period, spending just over 3 billion rands. Uh, with uh, our unemployment topping uh, the benefits, taking more than 80% of the benefits. So we paid about 2.5 billion rands just for ordinary benefits. I think the minister did touch on earlier that ordinarily UIF pays about between 14 and 15 billion rands per annum. And we deal with just over 700,000 beneficiaries in one year. And as you can see, during lockdown, we've already uh, processed 508,000 applications just during the lockdown period. Uh, which brings to question then that as the year unfolds, the number of people who are going to be claiming UIF <coughs> may increase substantially. Uh, I'll move now to controls. I'm also going to skip uh, page 20, uh, slide 21. The areas that the minister touched, I will not dwell on them and just lift up the few. Slide 21. On slide 21, in the main, um, is the ID, <coughs> the ID confirmation. These are controls that we introduced right in the beginning of the process. Because one of the things we wanted to make sure is to make is avoid people either double dipping or uh, claiming twice or deferring the system. The minister did touch on the UIF reference number that he only used once. With the ID number, we also check against the database to see if the individual is enjoying any other benefit. As you have seen earlier, that we've already paid up for three, just over three billion rands for other benefits. So if a, a person is already enjoying one of the UIF benefits, we have developed a solution such that it picks up that individual and it, it set it aside and doesn't process the payment. And if the person is enjoying either maternity or other benefits, like in some instances, we've picked up that there were people who, <clears throat> who were claiming for dead people. There's a number of cases where we picked up about, about 35 cases in one company where they, they claimed for people who were, were deceased. And it was through the confirmation with Home Affairs that we were able to confirm that these 35 people are deceased. And we are subjecting uh, such cases to our forensic investigation to look if the, this company was trying to defraud URF or not. Uh, the, the declaration is one key control measure that we use. If a company applies, we have to test it against the database because one of the key drivers to apply for URF is that your employees must be declared with URF. You, you need to have insured them. If you have not insured them at the time of application, you need to insure them so that we can pick up from the database. But in the main uh, members and chairperson, we want to make sure that the company owns the relationship between the employer and the employee. The company must say to us, this person that I'm claiming for is working for me. So that at the time comes later when we follow the money or we are following up on uh, contributions, penalties, and interest, the company we say to them, yes, you did sign off and say this people work for you. And, and that's why we are coming uh, to look at you. If you go to uh, slide number 22, just to continue on the controls. Uh, one of the controls on slide 22 is that if in, in a UIF reference number, slide 22, if a, a, UIF, ref, a UIF reference number a, a fraud has been reported. We freeze any activity on that UIF reference number until we ascertain what exactly is happening. Once we've cleared some of the shenanigans that may be happening on the reference number, we also uh, put together a process where we don't let the employees suffer because there's a possible fraud on the case. If there's no payment made to the company, then we process, if these are valid claims, we process to the employees so that at least they enjoy the benefit of having a, a contributor to UIF. Then I'm going to touch on the uh, slide 24, the concept of follow the money. 
Uh, the minister did touch on this. So I'm going to go straight to slide 25. Uh, <coughs> on slide 25, uh, what we're emphasizing here, Chair, is we've taken the, this approach because we want to make sure that every cent that has been spent on uh, on UIF beneficiaries end up with the UIF beneficiaries and it end up in the account. But what is also important in this process is we also need to make sure that the the, employ, the employer may have claimed for people to say they're waiting for him or for her. And this is the time to confirm. And also, once we, we, we've confirmed, but then they have not declared for these employees, we are able to raise a debt, as the minister said, we raise a debt against the company, how much they owe us in contribution, how much they owe us in penalties, and how much they owe us in interest. In the main, we're looking for uh, company bank statements, which reflects uh, the COVID-19 tears funds, uh, proof of payment from the bank, indicating the details of the employee by the employer, and then also the payroll information from the relevant employer. This is intended to ascertain that money did end up uh, with the employee. We've already started this process. We've tested 31 cases. Of the 31, 24 uh, has been honorable and we've honored the agreement to the T. They were able to pay employees the money that was due to them and transfer the funds. They also have submitted to UIF what needs to be submitted for us to be able to test if money was transferred to the employees. There's five uh, employers that have not uh, dispersed the money due to outstanding company declarations. Uh, this is one of our greatest uh, challenges uh, during this COVID-19 process, where an employer, over the years, they, they started off with 10 employees, and over the years, their employment complement grew to about 50, but they forgot to, to declare the 40 people. And when they are claiming now, they are claiming for the whole 50, and we cannot find the 40. So these employers, have we held the money um, to transfer to the employees because it would have they, they are claiming it would have caused conflict amongst the employees and therefore they're fixing their applications with URF. Then we have two employers where no evidence was submitted as yet and we are pursuing uh, the, these companies. If you go to the next slide, I'm going to skip and go to slide 27 because the information is, is the same, Chair, all we are reflecting here is we have withheld the name of the company and the reference number for security reason. If you look at company number 14, employer 14, uh, well, what we are, we are highlighting here, Chair, is there, there's a number of employers that during the process of applying, uh, they, 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 they messed up on the, on the lockdown period. Some of them, they applied for the lockdown for the whole month of May, when in fact they went back to um, to work uh, midway during May, but they didn't change the application date. As a result, we process for the whole group and then we transfer money to them. But these were some of the employers that came back and say, UIF, we made a mistake. We were supposed to apply for, for half the month and they paid us back this money. This is just one of the employers. If you look on the next page, we have three more employers who had the same experience on slide 28 where they came back and say, yes, we made a mistake in terms of the lockdown period. We used a, a longer lockdown when we went back by the second week of the process. Uh, Chair, I'm going to uh, skip now and introduce uh, Tsepiso Mapatane, uh, just to zero in on the fraud cases, Chair. But at high level, let me just take members to, to slide 34, then I'll hand over to Tsepiso. Uh, slide 34, Mflegazi. On slide 34, Chair, I'm just reflecting the summary of the fraud cases that we've received to date. In total, we have received 75 fraud cases. Uh, 26 of these cases um, is employer withholding or underpaying employees. This is as reported by uh, the complainant that, that phoned UIF for the call center. We have two cases where an employer was using an incorrect reference number. This is also a, a possibility of an identity theft that we picked up. Uh, that there were two employers that attempted to use someone's reference number, but we were able to pick it up. 
There were three. There were. It was one case of overpayment for employers. I think I've touched on this when we 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 looked into the the follow the money instances where a company applied for a longer period than they had anticipated. We also have six, case, six cases individual claim blocking company where we've blocked individual claims blocking company claims. Here at Chairperson, in the main, you find that a company is applying for, for deceased people, is applying for people who are already on maternity leave, or people whom they've already dismissed, but they are, they are applying again for these people and we pick them up. So if we pick up an individual, we block the whole reference number because we want to ascertain what exactly is going on with this case. And then we have six cases of companies that are non-compliant. They are not registered with URF. They have not declared any employer. They have not paid any contributions. They don't exist at all in the URF database. So these are companies that were not honoring the latter of the law in the country. Then we have three cases for incorrect banking details. These are banking details as provided by the employer. It is important, Chair, to emphasize here that when companies apply, we rely on the company giving us the correct information that we must confirm against different entities like the SARS and the banks and before we pay. And then the last one is the 31 cases of suspected fraud links. Here they vary from ghost, ghost employees, work and draw, where someone is um, <coughs> someone has lost their job and then they, they, they come back or they were on maternity leave, and when they, they they have not yet come back from maternity leave, but the company claims for them. A company claiming for terminated employees, and also collusion between employer and employee to lodge fraudulent claims. And let me hasten to say, Chairperson, up front, that even though we have not picked up any any possible collusion within URF, uh, the minister discharged on it. We are not ruling it out, Chair, because uh, and hence we are working with the hawks that will go. To, to the farthest extent to ascertain who are the forces, whether it's within URF or is within the companies or is within the compliance environment, we are going to, to be pursuing them. The chairperson and members, I'm going to give over to Tebiso to talk to us about the three key cases that has been in the media, just for him to walk us through what is happening in these cases. Uh, Tebiso, uh, it's slide 35. Good afternoon, um, um, Chairperson. Good afternoon, um, Honourable Members. My name is Tebiso Mapatane. I'm the Chief uh, Risk Officer, Director of Risk Management at UIF. I will take you through the fraud cases that we have at the moment. I will start off with the first case of uh, suspected 700,000 rent matter. Uh, in this particular case, uh, Members, I can inform the committee that um, the employer in question um, submitted information which had an which had an error in the banking details that they provided, and um, there's an issue with two of the numbers in the account number. But um, as the URF we received the application, we then processed the application, and um, the URF then paid into the account number that was provided by the employer. Now, subsequently to paying the employer. Um, the employer came back to us and said, I have not received the funds. And uh, we went and investigated. And then the employer themselves picked up that they actually provided the incorrect banking details. Um, so that's what happened in this instance. But I can inform the committee that we have a criminal case on this matter. And we have the Financial Intelligence Center and the Hawks assisting us with this matter. On the second matter of the 4.7 million, um, and in this particular case, what we do know is that a profile was created, um, Chairperson, with the um, details of a former employee, who, who in this case happens to be a pensioner. Now, what we do know is that this, this profile, when it was created, there was no claim that was put through. It was just a profile that was created with the details of the former employee. But uh, subsequently, um, the, a company information was then loaded onto this profile and the system calculated and then um, one of the important aspects that I need to highlight Chair, is that um, the, 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 the profile that was created indicated that um, 
for these benefits, the company opted that we pay the company. So because the option was that we need to pay the company, then um, the system calculated and then opted to pay for the company. But um, in this instance, it appeared um, the banking details that were there were that of the former uh, employee. Um, and, and this is what we learned later on. Subsequent to that, we managed to, to, to identify the individual who received the funds. Um, at that point in time, he had spent just over 100,000 rands and we managed to recover the 4.6 million. We, 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 um, we've also opened a, a police case on this one. We're working with the Hawks and other um, uh, law enforcement agencies in this matter as well, Jen. Um, on this matter as well, we do have an interim report that we've done internally um, that um, I just needed to highlight. And then on the seven, on the 5.7 meta, Chair, in this matter as well, what we do know is that a, a profile was created for the company, but in this profile, um, company information was reflected there, but the only difference with this one is that um, the banking details of um, an employee were then put in into that profile. Now, um, after creation of this profile, what we do know is that um, um, a claim for one individual was put through who, who is an employee of the company. And um, in this profile, they also opted that we must pay the employer. Um, and, and the system calculated the benefits for this one employee that was received and paid the employer. Then it so happens that um, the banking account that we, we, we paid into belongs to the employee. The amount we paid into this account was about 570 odd rands at that given time. Subsequent to that, what we also know is that um, the company managed to get access into the profile that was created by um, the, 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 the employee's profile. And um, we, what we also know is that um, the certain amendments that were made in the profile, but the banking details were not changed. The company also loaded um, the company records onto that profile. The system processed, and as as um, the employer had opted that we should pay the employer, we the system calculated and paid the employer. It so happens that um, the banking details that were there in the system belonged to the employee, so the payments were made to the employee's bank account. Now, Chair, so, what I need... Sorry, sir. Sorry. Can, can you repeat the last one? What, what transpired there? The 5.7 okay. million? Yes. yes Sorry chair. for that. Yeah. I'll start off again, Chair. On the 5.7 million matter, what we do know is that a profile um, was created and the, the company profile that was created, it had the company details, but one of the striking things that we, we, we realized with this profile is that the banking details were that of, the, of an employee. Now, after the profile was created, a claim was then put through our system, but for one person, for one employee. And um, the system then calculated and paid the benefits to this one one employee. The amount paid was just over 570 rands paid to the employee. Now, because the the employer or the profile, it was indicated that we should pay to the employer, then the system calculated and paid into the employer's bank account, which was provided in the um, profile company profile. Now, subsequent to this initial transaction being made, the company um, managed to get access into this profile that was created by uh, this individual. And um, the company, what we do know is that they managed to amend certain fields within the profile, but the striking one was the banking details. We know that that was not changed. Now, um, the company then loaded um, company data onto the profile. The system then calculated and um, because the employer had opted that we should pay the employer, the system calculated and paid into this 
um, company bank account that was provided in the employer's profile. It so happens that that bank account belongs to the employee. And um, after the system paid into, into, into the account, that's when now we have these issues that you see in the newspapers that we, we have, as the UF, we have paid into a correct bank account. Chair, the matter, this matter is also handled by the Hawks and uh, other law enforcement agencies. But I must highlight, Chair, that um, um, arrest is imminent. Um, we, 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 we are working with law enforcement to ensure that we, we, we finalize this matter. Um, what I also need to highlight to the committee is besides, besides this, this, this engagement, Chair, as the UIF, we do sit with the um, tax team that deals with COVID-related fraud matters. Uh, and this tax team compromise of different, different role players being your asset forfeiture, your financial intelligence center, your national prosecuting authority, amongst others that are part of this tax team. So we do do sit with the task team to provide them with the status of our cases and and they also update us in terms of how far they are with some of our matters. Chair, um, what I need to highlight to the committee is that um, when we realized that um, there was so there were some issues with these transactions before even the media coverage and so forth. As management, we then closed the system for a couple of days. And um, after we closed the system, we tried to understand if there were any gaps within the system and if we needed to improve um, controls. And um, I'm going to ask our COO to take you through some of the, 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 uh, the controls that we have um, identified and improved. And also um, so that you can also try to explain how the system operates and how the system pays companies. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just hand over to Judith for, us, for her to take us through the next part of the presentation. OK, can she do that? OK, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, good day and also good day to the portfolio committee members. Uh, Chair, I'm just going to take through in terms of the improvement in control that we have put in place, especially after we identified the cases that Mr. Tsepiso was referring to. And I think, Chairperson, it's also very critical for me to highlight, and I think Minister also covered it when he started with his presentation. This system that we are using to pay for COVID benefit, it's only three months old. We are not using the normal operational system that UIF has been using before COVID, paying for other ordinary benefit of UIF. The minister signed the directive, I think the first one was signed around the 25th of March. Only after minister have given us guidance in terms of how we need to administer this COVID benefit, we had to develop a system. And we started first with the manual process, and we've picked up a lot of delay because of the volumes that we had to deal with. So while in the process, we had to develop a new system. And if members can recall, we started making our first payment from the 16th of April. So it means we were using a system that was developed run about mid-March. Already by the 16th of April, we had to start uh, putting a, a, a benefits into, into different employers' account. And one of the key things that we had to do also was to develop new business processes because we were not using the normal business process that we've been using in UIF because this was a new benefit completely for us. And as a result, when we did that, we did some risk assessment. So before we develop any process, we had to take into account into the new uh, process that we're engaging on. What are the potential risks that we're going to be looking at? And majority of our risk was around fraud because one of the key things that was very evident for us is in the nature of this benefit and in the time that we are putting it in place, one of the key things that we're going to be faced with is fraud. Now, we've put in some controls in place, and I think Commissioner and Minister have taken us through those controls. And, but one of the reality is when you put in controls on something that you have not started, you have not seen, uh, you will think that your controls are adequate, but you're going to see and get the reality when you start implementing. That's when you start realizing actually what you are dealing with. 
And what it means, it means then you need to go back all the time. You can never say your controls are sufficient. It means you need to take an approach where all the time you go back and you review and amend your controls. And I think that's the process that we've been in as UIF in the last three months. So that is why every time when we pick up these fraud cases, we had to go back and look back into the control and improve them further. So one of the key things that uh, uh, Mr. Mapajani have highlighted is one of the key requirements is when you have to apply for COVID benefit, the first thing is you need to register as a user uh, into the system. And after registering as a user, you need to create a profile. And maybe just for clarity for members, one of the biggest control we've put at the time was uh, no one will access the UIF system without a UI reference number. And the reason why the reference number was very critical is because reference number is one of the key control within the system because even before COVID, that's where the profile of the employer lies. That's where it indicates to us who's the employer and who are the employees that belongs to this employer. So that is why one of the key things is you put in your reference number because at the time, the key control is to check are you the real employer? Have you been existing in UIF? And if you've been existing in UIF, what type of information as UIF do we have for you? And that's the main reason why the, 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 the reference number was put there as a control check. So in terms of what has happened, if I can just indicate, so when you create a profile, one of the key things that you are then doing at the time is you are indicating to us this is the name of the company. You indicating the detail in terms of a, a, a what are your address as a company and what are your contact details. And then from there, you create a profile. So in the profile, that's where the company. So after you, you register, chef, then you are provided with a user ID. So your reference number of UIF becomes your user ID and you create a, a password. Like any online system, you have to access it by putting in a password. So when you are registered, that's what you do. After now you have registered and you've got a password created, the next step is to create a profile. So in the profile, one of the key fundamental uh, uh, information that the employer provides there is what are the banking details of the company? is how the system is you employees of uif don't capture any information when relating to application of employers employer completely the claim are assessed based on the information that is captured by the employee because we are very much evident what was evident for us at the time was if we're going to allow manual capturing by our employees we are not going to cope with the volumes of application that we're going to get but what we rather did was to build in control in the system to validate this information that the employer is providing to us. So then the employer will create a profile and then in the profile, the employer will provide what are the banking detail. So the profile will be created with the banking detail of the employer. So for an example, if we take the 5.7 uh, case that Mr. Mapetani was referring to, what happened in this instance was there was a, 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 a person, employer detail were, cre were used to create a profile. So when I'm saying employer detail, it means whoever created the profile had the correct reference number of the company, had the name of the company, have the email address of the company uh, to that access. And then when it went into the profile, when it created the profile, the, the, on the applicant, the applicant chose the employer because one of the other options that the applicant has on the system is when you apply, you have to identify yourself. You have to indicate whether are you an employee, are you an employer, or are you a bargaining council because the system was designed to cater for the three. Also, when you choose the payment option, because when you also apply, you must also, uh, the employer also have the uh, option of choosing whether the money must be paid direct to the employees or if it's a bargaining council, you choose the option to say the money must be paid into the bargaining council or if you are an employer, the money must be paid into the employer account. So in the 5.7 case, the applicant went into the system, chose an option of an employer, 
accepted the terms and condition of the employer, even accepted the memorandum of understanding, because one of the key things at an application is the employer have to accept memorandum of understanding, which got terms and conditions of what uh, uh, is going to be applicable in terms of this agreement that we're having with UIF. So in this application, the person went through as an employer, accepted the terms and condition, even memorandum of understanding. Even when coming to the payment option, uh, the person, though at this case it, 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 it was an employee, he went ahead and chose an option of payment for the employer. However, in the banking detail, that the, uh, 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 the system then will ask you, what are the banking details of the employer? So this first person went ahead and provided personal banking detail under the profile of an employer. So he provided this banking detail on the system as an employer. So when the system was reading this banking detail, it was reading it as the banking detail of the employer and the payment option also be made to the employer. And that's why what Mr. Mapitan has indicated is the payment end up went in, into the bank account of the employee. But what, what also happened with that, the reason why you end up having an amount of about 5.7 paid into the bank account of an employee. What then subsequent happened, Mr. Mapetani indicated that there was a first application of 575. So in terms of the process, after you create a profile, you now have to go and say, now I'm applying for the employees. Now the system will request you, when you apply for employees, who are your employees? Then that's where then the applicant has to provide the ID of the employees. And then he will also indicate to say, uh, this is the salary the employee is earning and whether I'm paying that person during COVID, I mean, during lockdown period or not. So the applicant went ahead, provided for the, uh, for the IDs. The reason why this application was accepted is because it passed the control because commissioner has indicated one of the key control when an ID is captured, when you apply uh, for an ID or for an employee, one of the key control is to go and check into our database, which is the database we had before COVID-19. So what then the control goes into the database, it goes and check under that reference number. Do we have this person as an employee working for this company before COVID? Now, because this applicant worked for this company, then the system picked up this ID to say, yes, this employee works for the company. And that is the only reason why that application went through, because it passed that control, it passed that validation. So the application was processed and made. One of the key things that the commissioner also highlighted was one of the control in the system is if a reference number was used, when another person come again and try to use the reference number again, the system won't allow it. The system is going to display a message to say, you can not create a profile on this reference number because there's already a profile in existence. Now, in this 5.7 million case, there were three people involved here. So the first person that came and applied was the employee using profile as if it's the employer, the application was assessed. Now, the company appointed an accountant that must now come and apply for the actual company, meaning for other employees that work for that company. So when the accountant tried to log on into this account, he couldn't. The system indicated to say, no, this profile is already in use. You cannot be able to access this profile because what you need to do is to put in your reference number and put in your, 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 your password. Now, one of the key things that we have provided at the beginning was people to be able to, because sometimes people are not able to access their profile on the basis that they can forget their password. So one of the key things that we introduced at the time was to be able to have a process where people have forgotten or where they cannot get into their profile, they have an option of resetting the password. And when you reset the password, we have put in place a process where you have to pass through the validation process. So when the company or the accountant couldn't launch now the application for other employees because there was already profile existing, there was a reset of a password that was requested. Meaning, because this employer or the accountant couldn't create a new profile from the beginning, that profile that was created by the employee was already locked. So they had to get into that process because it was already existent. Now, what shows in terms of the system was there was a password reset. 
Now, one of the key things that the investigation will have to reveal is how did now the new applicant pass the validation uh, test? Because one of the key things that will be asked, it's, 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 it's information that indicates to say, are you really the owner of this profile? And in this instance, we know that the first profile was created by the employee, but the accountant managed also to get access into the same profile. So the investigation will reveal there if there was a fall play by the UIF officials, like Commissioner has indicated, the investigation will reveal at this stage, we can't say they were not involved in that. So then the second person managed to get a profile access into this profile that was created by the employee. Now, remember one of the key thing I highlighted is in the profile, one of the key thing that is there is the banking detail. So when the accountant had an access into the profile, he could see all the information that is there. So all the information that the employee have already captured, the information that he provided, even the banking detail that was existing in the system at the time, the, the, the accountant could see that information. And because the accountant was in the profile, the accountant could have changed those banking details if he needed to. Because the accountant could have picked up at the time to say the banking details that are here are not the same as the banking detail of the employer. However, those banking details were not changed. Other, other employees' applications were lost by this second person. So he also lost the employees. And because this employee really worked for this company, their application was assessed. And the application, I mean, the payment was made for other employees. But because the banking detail in the profile was not changed to the banking detail of the employer, after the application of other employees were lost and the application was submitted, the system was still having the banking detail of the employees under the banking detail of the employer. And hence the system went ahead and validated that, uh, I mean, and paid into that bank account. Now, one of the key things that we've picked up from that case which we needed to, 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 to increase in terms of control. We then realized that around the issue of the profile, we have to increase control. One of the key things that we realized was it was easy for people to access control that are already created. Now, at the beginning, because majority of the employers were coming and applying in the system, they were forgetting their password. So all the time we had number of calls where we had to reset the password not because necessarily they were fraudulent, but because people were coming to us to say, I created my profile, I created the password, I forgot what my password is. So there were a number of calls that were coming through. Now to deal with the number of calls, we give a team of team of people for them to manage the reset of the password. But what these two cases has indicated to us was actually there was a risk because the more people we give them access to change, in the profile or to, to do the reset of a password is a risk for us. So what we did subsequent to these two cases, we then took that control of resetting of a password from a team of people. It's currently only done by three individuals. And one of the key things that we have now put in place also is to have the audit trade, as in when, whenever there are changes that have been made. So one of the key control that we have put there is the issue of the IP address. So at the beginning, when we have set up the system, we, we, we've put in the control of the IP address when the employer downloads the payment. Because at the time, we needed confirmation to say the employer did receive the money. But what we realized then there, uh, based on these cases, is there can be different people going into the same profile, not being the same people. So what we have put now as a new control is whoever goes into the profile, the system is going to record the IP address. So meaning the first person that come and create a profile, if the second person goes into that uh, uh, profile, but is not using the same computer as the original person who created the profile, the system will be able to pick it up. But one of the key things that we have also put in place, which we picked up that it was also a gap in the control, was on the issue of the confirmation of the banking detail. Because at the time, like Minister has indicated, our process as UIF all along, we've been paying to employees. So the existing controls that we have on bank verification, bank validation previously for us before COVID was more when we paying to employees. But during COVID, based on this new process, we had to now start paying to employers, paying to the bargaining council, and it was a new process for us. 
But we did put controls in place at the beginning where we put in the bank validation. So what the system was doing previously was when you put in your bank in detail, we were sending before we before we pay, we send the file to the bank to say, confirm this bank account for us before we pay into this bank account. But at the time, the rule was to check, is this bank account correct? So for an example, if an account belongs to FNB, normally the banking detail of or the account numbers of FNB will start with 6-2, whatever. The branch code of FNB is this one, plus the universal code is this one. So when you are sending to the bank for validation, if it's a bank account for FNB, it will check whether really the sequencing banking account is correct, the, the branch code provided, is it correct, and all of that. So where there's information or the bank or the account is inactive, so that's what the validation will check. So even in these two instances, it was sent to the bank for validation. So the bank validated it because it was a correct bank account. Yes, it was active. Yes, the branch code that was provided was correct. But what we then picked up after these two fraud cases that we have now changed, we now added bank verification. So what bank verification do more than bank validation is that it now also confirms, does this bank account belong to this person? So it's no longer only checking the validity of the banking detail, but it also trying to validate the owner of the account. And the reason why we put this into account is to bridge in that gap because bank verification is going to assist in the similar case. The system then could have is going to pick up to say, you know, though the banking detail are provided under the employer, but this banking detail is not of a company. This banking detail is of an employee. So bank verification will indicate to us to say the company that has applies is CSG, for an example, but it will also say to us, but the bank account provided doesn't belong to CSG because it's not according to the profile that is sitting at the bank for CSG. So that's an additional control that we had to put in place after these fraud cases for us to do, because we have realized that majority of the fraud cases were around the banking detail. So we had to put in those control around the banking detail. And also, what we have put in place now is whenever there's a fraud detected application, we now put in this case into, we are blocking them in the system so that it doesn't allow further activity into it. However, there's different uh, uh, controls around this area. So Mr. Mapatani has made an example to say, in other cases, the fraud cases that we picked up is where the employer have not paid their employee all the amount that UIF has paid. So for an example, in a case where it's reported to us to say, according to UIF, I was supposed to pay to be paid 4,000 rent, but my employer has only paid me 1,000. So though this account is going to be frozen in the system, sort of, uh, for, because we are investigating this amount of uh, uh, underpayment, but what we allow the system to do is the, the, the employer can still apply in this instance, can still apply, but we're no longer going to accept payment to go into the employer bank account or to the bargaining council account. We're only going to force for that application that the payment must go direct to the employee. So we have allowed that on the basis that though these cases are investigated, our main reason was let the employee not suffer because of the fault that could have been done by the company or the bargaining council. But where is an instance of a fraud that we don't know for sure whether this company exists? We don't know for sure even the employees are legit. No payment will be made in those instances. So those cases will be uh, defraud, I mean, will be penned in the system until it's all finalized. But what we then did further was because these are the two cases that we have picked up. Then the question that came to us to say, are there no other similar cases that has happened that we are not aware of? So that we can clear for ourselves whether are these two cases the only one or the 75 cases are the only one? What we then did, especially with these two cases that Mr. Mapetani has, has spoken about, where we've picked up that there was an issue on the changing of the banking detail, there was an issue on the profile. What we then did is, is we ran a report on all the payments we have already made into the system, where there was a access change of reset of a password, 
where they were banking detail that were amended. So we have taken all those cases and we have referred them to our forensic people for them to confirm for us to say on this account, because they're in a similar nature of the fraud one, was the money really paid into the right people? Was really the people that have applied being the so as soon as we receive that report from the from the forensic, it will indicate to us to what extent these fraud cases have been. And those are some of the changes that we have done in terms of the control chain. I will stop there. However, I also want to indicate to say it's a continuous process for us. We are continue going to improve our controls based on the cases as we pick up different fraud cases. Thank you, Chair. Chair? Thank you, Chair. We can hand back to you. We are done with the presentation, Chairperson. Okay. No, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much, Commissioner. Can you mute, Commissioner? Okay. Thank you. Commissioner, okay. Thank you very much, members. It is, it's quite an an interesting presentation. I have just uh, I've requested the committee section to check if we can't be extended uh, with 30 minutes or uh, so that we were supposed to finish at three so that we at least we try to exhaust and uh, allow them to to respond. On these, on these matters that are very interesting. What now I will do, I will hand over to the, to the members, for members to, to ask questions. But because of the time limitations, limitation honorable members, I will, I will humbly request that members don't have preambles, go straight to the question so that we are then able to get our response within the, the time allocated. That, that will be my humble request, uh, honorable members. My gadget is not a, I, I will then go and see uh, members who would like to ask questions. Uh, if, if, if members can, uh, I hope the Secretariat can assist me in terms of uh, yeah. indicating who are the members that would like to ask questions. I would like to, Madam Chair. That's Honorable Bagram. Who is the next? I would Much also honest. like you, Madam Chair, please. Dana? We must. It's Honorable Bagram. Dinner. I see Honorable, Honorable Cardo's hand is up. Honorable Denner, Chair. Okay. Honorable Matevula. Honorable Hendricks. Come again. Honorable Hendricks. Chair. Honorable Matevula. Chair. Chair. Honorable Hello, Honourable Chair. members. Honourable yes. Bosch, please. Honourable Bostov. Thank you. Chair. Honourable. Chair, did you write me to in Chuaku? No, Honourable Chuaku, please, please. I and I, 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 I've identified you. So you are going okay, to. Okay, I'm not going to come. Honourable Matevula. Honourable. Yes. Honourable Matevula. Nonsele. Honorable Nonsele. Honorable Aplene. Honorable Aplene. Aplene. Yes. Oh. Okay. Honorable Bakram. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I do want to ask before, uh, what the minister before that, has to say. Before that, Honorable Bikram, before that, sorry, is Honorable Apleni a member of the NSOP? 
I don't know. Yes, ma'am. Am I gay? Yes. Oh. Okay. Okay. Yes, Honorable Speaker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I wanted the minister to make a comment in that I am receiving about 250 emails per day for the last three months with everyone telling me that the UIF has failed the workers of South Africa. Um, I don't know what he, if he wants to make a comment on that because I'm getting about 250 complaints a day. I'm sending about 50 to 100 of those complaints per day onto the commissioner uh, for his comments. Uh, Thankfully, the commissioner is getting back to me on a lot of them. At about half, I'm not getting any response. I also, I see that the minister has also raised an issue about the possible financing of the UIF into the future. And, and what, is, what is his prediction that if we do get, the Treasury said we'll get something like up to 7 million more retrenchments, uh, will they be able to cope with anything up to 7 million? I noticed that he's trying to predict about half of that. Have we got the finance for it? And the other thing is, I'd like the minister to possibly name and shame the companies. We need their names. And let's come forward with them so that we know who we're dealing with. If a company has committed fraud, we must know about it. It should be public. Um, and I'd like him to, to tell us about that. Minister also, and uh, Commissioner Maripeng, the... Um, People are telling me, and I'm getting this every day as well, and I've sent it on to you, that the ordinary benefits, maternity, dismissal, all those ordinary benefits seem to have been put on hold uh, pending the TERS outcome, and somehow people are just not getting paid. Um, but then at one stage, the minister said that independent contractors and sole practitioners would be paid, and it seems that they're not getting paid at all. Maybe you can comment on that one. Uh, can we, Honourable Begram, Honourable Begram, Honourable yeah. Begram, please, can you can you hold on there? Give uh, so that we've got a long list. We've got a couple of things. We have got a lo we've got a long list so that we are able to uh, other members are able to ask questions. We'll come back if there is a need, and we'll 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 indicate the process to follow. Having said that, can I give Honourable Dana a chance? Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for the presentation. Good morning to the Minister and um, the Commission and everyone. I just have a few questions. The first one is the CFO mentioned that verif bank verification, not only validity, was built into the into the program. I would just like to know when was the bank verification introduced into the verification process? Then secondly, um, 75 cases are being inspected um, of, of fraud. Um, that's 75 of 704,000 valid employer claims. So that's about 0.01%. And of that 75, already 10 million has been identified as potential fraud. So um, what is the timeline on the audit? I would just like to know that. And then also, um, I read during the week that about 1 million workers payments are behind. That's about 4.2 billion rand. Um, due to, according to the story that I read, a technical glitch, if the commissioner could just tell us what this technical glitch was, what happened, and how far they are in um, paying that one million workers that, that have not still, uh, still not received their payments. Um, there are outstanding functionalities in the system. Um, I communicated with the fund during the past few weeks, and I was told there were outstanding functionalities. For instance, for the fund, to be able to cancel um, a worker who has been claimed for by an employer for this, but who has been um, on maternity leave or has been retrenched or something like that. So how long will it take for these outstanding functionalities to be built into the system so it can function optimally? Um, um, then, I'm coming to the end, Chair. Um, I would just like to know what the progress is on the June claims and how many payments are still outstanding for April and May, respectively, and have any UIF employees been identified as being part of the fraudulent activity? That's Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Kado. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I've just been on to the website now, and I see that June applications have gone live, but it's not actually possible to 
get inside of the system. It's just a message saying that June applications are now open. Um, I would like to know from the Minister the reason for the delay with uh, June applications being opened. I know the Minister told us that May applications had been delayed because employers hadn't handed over April payments to employees. But if I remember correctly, May applications only opened right at the end of May because of a damaged underground cable that caused IT glitches. Now, on the one or two or three occasions that the portal for June applications has gone live, immediately afterwards, I've been inundated with messages from employers sending me screenshots of the personal information of their competitors, including employees' names, ID numbers, UIF numbers, remuneration details, and banking details. And obviously, this constitutes a massive security breach. It's a violation of the Protection of Personal Information Act, and presumably it's going to open the UIF up to legal action. So what is the cause of the security breach? Um, will it be properly fixed by this weekend? And have any employers brought legal action against the UIF for the security breach yet? Uh, secondly, how much money is left in the pot for the COVID-19 TERS benefit? We know that 40 billion rand was set aside initially. From your presentation, it's clear that the UIF dispersed 20 billion rand in April and 10 billion rand in May. You haven't finished processing May claims yet. Uh, June applications haven't yet begun being processed and already three quarters of that 40 billion rand has been dispersed. So how much money do you envisage the UIF will have paid out in terms of the TERS benefits uh, covering the months of April, May and June by the time the whole thing is over. Then on the fraud case, I'm glad to hear the Commissioner's reassurance that UIF officials will be investigated if there's any evidence that points a finger at them. I'm just surprised that it's taking so long to gather that evidence because it really does seem unlikely to me that in that particular case of fraud and money laundering of 5.7 million rand, uh, where the money was dispersed in something like, you know, five days to 28 different bank accounts uh, in rapid fire action, uh, surely that couldn't have taken place without the collaboration and collusion of UIF officials. It seems to have necessitated some kind of inside knowledge. And then just finally, Chair, there are a few sectors that as things stand, won't be able to open for many months yet. Uh, and I'm getting a number of employers from the tourism sector, for example, approaching me and pleading that the uh, COVID-19 tour scheme gets extended for their sector. Uh, is this something that the minister and the URF would be open to and persuadable about? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Kado. Honorable Matebula. Honorable Matebula. Honorable Matebula. If there's a problem with Honorable can Matebula. You can you hear Honorable me? Matebula. Yes, I can. Over uh, to you. Thank you very much, Chair. I'd really like to firstly to apologize for not switching off my camera. I'm living in a deep rural area. Network is a problem. My question to the department is regarding the domestic worker, workers. I really like to know whether they were assisting those ones who were registered only with the UIF and how are they going to assist those ones who are not registered to the UIF. And then regarding question number two, regarding the people who were WDP, how are they going to deal with them and how are we going to how are they going to make sure they, that they recover? That man. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Matebula, Honorable Boschoff. Thank you very much, Chair. Good afternoon, Minister. Um, I think we're all sitting with the same problems because the questions I had were also answered, but I would just like to make a comment. Minister, you say that the scale of support has been unprecedented. I beg to differ, because as my colleagues, Honorable Bagram and Cardo have said, the amount of calls that we get with regard to employees trying to access the portals 
is something very, very difficult for them and many, many, many people. Um, this is their last lifeline to survival is a little bit of benefit from the UIF. So I'm asking you to please, with your department, ensure that these portals are um, accessible and that um, people are given acknowledgement of receipt because many people apply, but they don't even get an acknowledgement of receipt that their application will be attended to. And then another thing that one could look at is to update applicants to say, okay, this is where we stand with your application. It, it will be attended to within the next week so that we as, as members of parliament are not continually inundated with calls to try and assist them. And here I also want to, on this platform, thank uh, my colleague, Honorable Bagram, for the assistance that he's given to the NCOP members in assisting their people that have been calling. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Botsov. Can we get uh, Honorable Tsoake? Then. Hello. Is Honorable Tsoake in? Hello, Honorable Members. Am I audible? Yes, yeah. audible. Honorable Chwaku is there. Yes, I'm here. Yes. All right, no, thank you very much, Chair. My name is Mtini Chwaku. People are always pronouncing my name uh, very weird. I don't know why, but it's okay. <laughs> I forgive you. <laughs> no, Chair, thank you very much. Um, ben Zella, what you Chair, there's a specific question. Eh? Some of them, uh, actually, some of my questions have been uh, covered by other members. Uh, Benzela were to eat either the the minister or the the commissioner ne, to really describe this COVID-19 tariffs ne, benefit. How is it calculated? Because there are other companies ne, who are paying a full amount. Uh, for example, ne, the way that I understand it is that if an individual is not working, due to COVID-19, and that, that individual will be paid tariffs. Uh, the trick there is the issue of uh, people who are earning e, what you call this thing, a minimum wage of the, you know, 3, you know 3,500. Do you, do you apply that formula of 38, 60% ratio? Now, Mr. Kalanjoguti, can you describe this? This is actually valid for the petrol attendants for the gardeners, for the workers, on the, the cleaners everywhere, because a majority of them are getting, uh, you know, the minimum wage. Now there are other companies who are applying a different formula. We have one. This for that, that 38 to 60 uh, percent. Man, the way that I know it is that if you are earning a minimum wage and you did not uh, uh, go to where you did not go to due to COVID-19, you should be getting them the maximum benefit, the maximum amount, and then also even. Uh, when let's say you worked less hours, the other hours that you would have worked would have been topped up to you know to the minimum wage. Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, will be you know will, the COVID nineteen would be used to top up. Uh, and that so please, uh, 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 Chairperson, that's a question. Uh, I think many companies are confused of in the companies that you've done an oversight on, and there are many people who are actually uh, uh, listening now just to say that which formula do you use? Because others they don't want to use this money, and uh, and some are using it, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, wrongly. They actually sending the, this money back, and also, Benditelo uh, Buza, chairperson, please, uh, who is the person? We have because of the large volumes of calls that were there concerning this UIF. The the EFF has set up a labor desk that has been. A lot of calls have been come in there. So, basically, Buzma, who is this individual that we can talk to, and uh, so that these we can forward some of these complaints to 
to, 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 to actually that person, or we can actually assist this department, making sure that these uh, uh, queries are, are actually being sorted out. Uh, I hear the other member is talking about the commissioner. I've been trying, I've called the commissioner. We are calling inspectors. We are calling the call centers, Chairperson. Honestly, I'm humbly coming to you. We've been calling them. No one has been picking up our calls. And this is actually, I think as the member said, it's our lifeline. And there, there is a, a fight between the, 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 the workers and the employees. That is the OT, what is happening. And then when we go there and ask, but you know, it's a department. So we want to know, okay. uh, Chair, please, can you just assist us on this one? Who is the person that we can forward all questions and all complaints that are there so that this thing can be sorted out? My last one, uh, Chair, as we said, my, my very Thank last one. My, my very last one, Chair, is very serious, Chair Uti. There are people in a chair at the beginning who were paid a normal UIF because the commissioner and the minister were saying that uh, there was a confusion in terms of, of the, you know, at, at the beginning there was all these processes that were, they had to change our systems. Now there are a lot of people who have been paid a normal UIF and not the COVID-19 UIF. So they've been asking, Koti, what is going to happen to those people now? because of the payment of the normal UIF. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable, it's, it's then going to be Honorable Hendricks. Honorable Hendricks. Honorable Chair, thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Honorable Chair, you, uh, uh, I hope you don't mind, but we, we would like to thank the Minister and the Commissioner for assisting millions of South Africans and their hard work has not gone unnoticed. Yes, our parliamentary constituent office has received many calls, and most of the calls were to thank the government for the assistance. However, the previous speaker uh, has indicated that it's very difficult to get through uh, to, to, to list and register the complaints that we get at our parliamentary constituency offices. And Honorable Chair, I would like to appeal to you to request a special email hotline for members of parliament uh, to see so that we can get preferential treatment and get these queries uh, sorted out. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Hendricks. Can we get Honorable Aplay? Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Uh, uh, Chair, mine will be uh, very short. Uh, I'm very much concerned about, uh, you know, there has been a frustration, much frustration to the workers uh, about this uh, uh, UIF thing, which has led uh, some of the workers to uh, engage uh, in an, uh, unprotected strikes, illegal strikes, if one can call it that way. Uh, understandably so, because they were very much frustrated. Uh, now, my appeal uh, to the minister is that this has led to so many workers uh, getting expelled from work. Uh, the example of that would be Takama uh, factory in King Williamstown in Zonicha, uh, where you have uh, hundreds of workers were expelled because they have actually engaged on an illegal strike because of the frustration about the UIF thing. And uh, now my appeal to the minister was, uh, is there any intervention that the minister can... Hello? Okay. Uh, is there any intervention that the yeah. minister can have uh, just to say to the uh, employers that uh, uh, maybe it would be not advisable uh, for the uh, employers to jump to expelling the workers uh, because of the frustration they have instead of explaining and trying to find a solution uh, that would uh, uh, not lead to the workers being losing their work. So that was my appeal to the minister that uh, I don't think it is advisable for the workers to quickly jump to expelling the workers. So can the minister intervene in such, uh, uh, the department intervene in such uh, cases? Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Aplain. Honorable Nonsale. Thank, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. 
Thank you, thank you, Honourable Chairperson. Uh, let me greet the Minister, the Deputy Minister, and the Honourable Members. Chairperson, on the questions that I want to raise is with regard to the question that say that that says uh, who, I would want to first appreciate the input that has been made by the Commissioner. But the specific question that goes to the question to the Commissioner is. Uh, about the interventions that they have uh, devised uh, with regard to improving performance within the UIF uh, uh, project. Specifically, the appreciation of the uh, call center that they have, in fact, set up that receives uh, urgent calls and deals with all the backlogs that, uh, that afflicted uh, the UIF. But however, I thought that a uh, commissioner would also no. speak more about the challenges inherent within the UIM no that, have, no that have resulted in some of the challenges that we're speaking about. So I would want to uh, the commissioner to speak uh, yeah. on that. The second one is with regard to the issue of the areas of, of agency that is for particular attention, particularly the regarding the, the fraud that has taken place. And if a uh, commissioner can take us into confidence with regard to any other people other than those who are responsible for password resets, uh, if, for instance, there are any further investigations that are, t are taking place internally, so that we have a sense of what is going on. The third area, Chair, is with regard to slide 15. On the presentation that the commissioner has made on slide 15, that reflects the payments that have been made to sectors uh, of note and of uh, uh, concern on my side is that is the efficiency that has been made in paying overall across sectors. But I've noted the payments that have been made to domestic workers, which amounts to 88 million and payments made to taxi industry, which amounts to 10 million. Uh, whilst appreciating the, the efficiency that has been made. But one, one of concern is that these are sectors that have just recently came on board and the inability, therefore, of the UIF to timeously pay uh, institutions that have been there for quite some time is quite amazing. If perhaps a commissioner as well can elaborate a bit as to how the they have been able to get efficiency around specifically these two uh, highly informalized uh, uh, sectors, how they've been able to effect the payments. The, the third area uh, question, Chair, is with regard to on slide 25, where they, they have uh, reported that they've been uh, inflated numbers of employees that have been submitted that do not correspond to the to records and the register they have uh, within the UIF. And whether, for instance, there has been any attempt to engage or use uh, in, in the inspectorate so that they do the, the on-site inspection to verify those members or the workers on the ground. The last question re re relates to the fraud interventions. Uh, whilst appreciating the overall presentation that has been made, uh, just one question on, on slide 36 that relates to the point that has been made there by the lady who was reporting. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't pick up her name. So the point made here is that with regard to an area where an employee reference was used, uh, the internal system has been able to reflect that indeed that employee is registered with that employer. But what, what the question is from my side is that when the employer details then were loaded, why the same process was not followed so that they are able therefore to verify both the, the, the details of the employer and as well as the account numbers. So those are the questions Ted, that I wanted to raise. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Nunsele. I don't know, uh, oh, I was going to ask you, Honorable Nunsele, to, 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 to mute. 
On my side, honorable members, uh, I just, I've just got two questions, uh, honorable, uh, I mean, uh, commissioner. One, in listening, the fraud and the double paying has been more on tears. I would be interested also to know in the normal, in the normal, in the normal payment of, of normal claims, like maternity leave and whatever, have you ever experienced a challenge of people that are paid double in the normal process of, 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 of UIF? Because we want to also have a balance. We don't only check in terms of the tariff processes, but we must also have an understanding in terms of the state and the volume of whatever challenges and fraud that may be in the normal uh, 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 UIF uh, processes. Secondly, when you are explaining the whole issue of, of fraud and how the system was being able to be manipulated, what come to my mind is this question, and you must uh, pardon my ignorance in, on that area. How long is a person for how long is a person allowed to be in the system of UIF after having received his or her claim? My question is more related, it's more on the normal claims. Don't you apply it is 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 dismissed applied for a, for UIF and the last he get his or he yeah. get her claim the last payment now how long do you the system keep my name i'm asking this because i i may, i may be wrong but i suspect that maybe that is a another loophole that may be happening I'm, I'm happy when you are then saying you are not dismissing the possibility of a manipulation from inside. So that, that, that's why the question, my question is, is, is coming from that. How long are claimants kept in the, in the UIF system? Honorable members, we are, those are the two questions for now. We have been allowed uh, to, to. We'll go. Sir. We'll go over. Sir. Hello. I had uh, used my raise uh, my raise your hand option. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Can you can you allow me to finish what I was going to say? We 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 are going to be able to go up to four o'clock. Uh, so that members may not must not panic in terms of maybe our questions may not be responded to. Honorable Honorable Muimang, sorry for that. You may ask. Thank you, thank you, thank you for for the opportunity. Uh, and also let me also start by appreciating the. The presentation is led by the by, by the by the minister. Uh, <clears throat> my, my entry point, uh, chairperson, is uh, with regard to the uh, the concern that is beginning to emerge from the presentation around uh, employers that are not paying over what is due to the vulnerable workers. I think. Uh, it is clear that uh, from 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 the from April, I think uh, much has been done in terms of distributing uh, 21 billion. Uh, but the concern, I believe, is around May. May, though uh, 3.2 billion has been paid, uh, the challenge uh, is around uh, the uh, the 85,000 workers. Uh, the 85,000 employers that uh, that have not submitted documents for May, which obviously deprive uh, 
uh, the uh, the way the millions of workers for receiving their 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 money. I just want to check the the measures that are in place uh, that uh, that the commission and the department is putting in place to put pressure on this uh, on these companies uh, to uh, provide the the, ne the necessary outstanding documents so that they were able to mitigate the impact of this COVID-19 uh, on those vulnerable workers. Uh, I'm raising this point because uh, uh, much work has been done. I think just in terms of the track record from April and May payments, clearly billions of rands have been paid, but there will be those uh, areas of concern uh, which obviously uh, relates to the inability on the part of the of the employers to provide uh, the necessary documents. Uh, secondly, I think the 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 the, 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 the uh, follow the money approach. I'm, I'm I'm very comfortable with the with the approach that the department has put in place uh, to ensure that uh, there are control uh, mechanisms in place to be able to to identify. Uh, these uh, potential fraudulent areas. I'm raising this point given the amount of money that has been paid and what is in the media for now, and also the, 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 the number of investigations that are taking place, so that at least we must not be able to, to, to downplay the, the, the good work also that, uh, that is being done. Uh, and therefore, the, the, the last point will be the, the audit that is being done by the AG if the if, if the team can just uh, 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 elaborate more uh, whether the 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 the, the aid is going to audit the work of the service provider that has been done to be able to to ensure that the processes that are in place are able to meet the necessary standard because i get a sense that there are two audits uh, the internal one done by the, the department through the appointment of the service provider and then also the last one, uh, there's an AG also that will be uh, doing some audit on those processes. Thank you, Chairperson. No, thank you. Thank you very much, honorable members. What we are going to do now, we are going to allow the, the, the minister and the commissioner to respond. Can all members mute, please? Honorable Dango, can you mute? Honorable Dango, can you please mute? I am trying to. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on the floor, Chair. Mm -hmm. Can I continue, Chair? Can I continue, Chair? No, just wait, Minister. I want to be able to mute. There's too much noise. It is back. Mr. Sakasa, can you please uh, attend to that? The time that we are giving you, Minister, and your team, it will be to respond. It will be up to half past two because we will then have a very short uh, 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 round, second round. So you can continue. You can you you can start, and we will then uh, you, you the time is up to half past two for your comments and responses of from your team. Thank you very much. Over to Thank you, you, Minister. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, I just want to make this. Do you hear me, Chairperson? Do you hear me? I can hear you, Minister. Uh, Chairperson, thank you. I, I just want to make this general comment about the corruption. There is always a corrupter and a corruptee. The possibilities are there that those who are corrupt from outside are in collusion with some inside our own system in the department. And 
But uh, these are all the issues we must investigate. And we don't want also to jump into suspensions whilst we're still investigating. Because, you know, our labor laws are very strict. You can quickly suspend and you don't finish the investigation, especially if you are involving a, a number of other agencies. I thought that I must make that general comment. Um, but it's clear that there might be uh, corrupt and corruptees, some who are working with people inside. The, the question by uh, Honorable uh, Bahrain, who has received 250 complaints per, per day, it's good, good. But I think it would be proper that all those complaints, they are properly documented, sent to the office, and those who are uh, in the operational level, they deal with these complaints one by one. And I think the commissioner might tell us how long these are going to take. I don't think the minister will be able to tell you about how those numbers will be able to, or how long will they take. The people in the operations, the COO and so on, Maybe they must explain what is their process when they receive a complaint. What do they do? The issue of my comment in relation to the massive uh, layoffs and what the Treasury has predicted, the 7 million, I, I think there are different figures. Others are quoting 3 million, others are saying anything between 3 million and 7 million. We're not sure exactly the number. We will see as we are dealing with this matter. And I think there are people who are hard at work coming up with the different uh, different protections. But what is very clear, there's no doubt to the Honorable Bagrain, the fund is going to be under pressure. The fund might be forced to recall all its investment. And what does that mean? If it means that we might have to sit and relook at uh, including the, the 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 package which we are giving, relook at our own uh, formula for e calculation because it's a fact. If there is no money, we are not going to be able to pay. If you go to treasurer, if we look at the bailouts which people are requesting from treasury now. It's, it's clear that some of the monies we'd love to have are not going to be there. So, so we'll have to be creative. And it means as social partners, as government with labor and business and the communities, we will have to face this thing head on and say, what are we going to do? I don't believe that this is going to be a permanent solution, the issue of the UIF. It's more of a relief. But I think the biggest issue is where are we going to be able to create employment? And what is our package saying uh, in terms of the interventions which we will have to make? At some stage, we will have to come back and talk about the interventions which the government is making and the discussions which are taking place in government because there are those discussions to talk about how to fast track um, the creation of jobs in which sectors and so on. But it's not going to be a silver bullet in certain, um, maybe in certain industries, whether you're talking about agriculture, you're talking about uh, the public employment, you're talking about the digital and so on. So, but it's what is very clear is it's not going to be an easy thing. The third point was the naming and shaming. We will do that once we are confident that we have met all the legalities, and we are going to be guided by our legal people. We are wanting to do that, and they have also been able to say, no, 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 you don't rush until you are thorough with your investigation. Now you have to arrest the people, because you can name and shame you go to court, and then your, 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 your case, because of lack of witnesses or whatever, it doesn't hold. And then what happens? And then those people start claiming you. It's when we are very confident that now we have very strong cases are 
against individuals. Let me say this thing. When I'm saying they are corrupt, corrupt and corruptees, and some of the people are inside, we must be able to identify exactly who are those individuals in which, but on, 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 on the issue which was asked by the honorable member um, about uh, from the FF plus, what are the timelines of the audit? No, no, the DG or the commissioner can answer that. But remember that the scope of this audit we're talking about, if we are going to audit everything, talking about 28 billion, talking about over 500,000 employers, that's a very huge scope. We have to employ a number of auditors. And I think in one of the forums, the commissioner or the DG did indicate that um, we had put money aside in order to be able to do this work. So it's going to be very massive work. I can't be able to say maybe the commissioner or um, the CFO or the COO would be able to, 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 to say that. And I thought that what is also important is when I pay the, the million, which is outstanding, once every, once every uh, application has been verified and um, I think those who are processing are satisfied, they are going to pay. And I've said, even if it's after uh, three months, if it's legitimate, we have to satisfy ourselves and pay that particular amount. <clears throat> but you see, there's a figure which has been dented of a million workers who have not been paid. <clears throat> My question is, is, who are those workers? In which sectors? <clears throat> who has done that research? Or are we just talking about what is in the media? What we want now, it's not the general statistics. We want the specifics to say this sector, this company, these are the number of the workers. We want to know exactly that. Those must be given to us. And then you chase us on the basis of those workers which you have given us. Not on the general number which is being um, um, put in the media, a million. Which sectors, which companies give us those so that and we are holders to account on the basis of those. Honorable Cardo is uh, <clears throat> the reason for the delay. I'll, I'll give that to the uh, commissioner because it's an operational, uh, what to call, matter. Um, in fact, most of the issues which have, how much money do you envisage <clears throat> when you have covered May and June? I think our actuaries will be able to tell that, but what I know, it's far above what we had projected. We had projected for the three months, 40 billion rent. Now it's clear that already we're going beyond that. In fact, we're going to be forced to temper into some of the investment if uh, if uh, <clears throat> if those claims are legitimate. And I think also honorable members, what they must also do, it will be important to hear the people when they claim the UIF to know exactly whether these people qualify or do not qualify. Because one of the problems we've set with it's a problem where people know that there's money in the UIF. Some of them left work at, in 2014. They say we're being OT UIF, we've heard that there's money. These are a number of cases we've been dealing with. Um, well, how do you calculate will give them to, to, to the um, EFF and set up a, a labor desk? To, to help people with the complaints. I think the, the, the COO must be able to give that. But I must be honest, there have been disappointments with, with, our, um, with our, what do you call it? The hotline. Many people have long been complaining and have been urging the money to with this particular matter, they must also they must also answer, and uh, and I think there has been a lot of disappointments here. It it goes, it stops and go, it stops and go, it stops and go. There, and I think I'm not sure whether it's under pressure or it's a poor system. But I must mention this, uh, honourable members. I must mention this that uh, 
as much as we are committed to improve this efficiency of our system of the two funds, it has been very difficult to disrupt the whole current system of both the UIF and uh, it's going to be very difficult. We keep on tempering here and there. And uh, we think that until we move past this COVID-19 period of these payments, uh, we'll be able now to do something else. I've requested already the DG to, to, to undertake an organizational architecture, an assessment, organizational architecture assessment uh, of the UIF. And this will include, um, it's going to include to look at, at the services delivery required, to look at, uh, review the current structures and the systems, if they are fit to deliver. Uh, because I think some people have said these are not fit to deliver. There have been serious problems. And they must look at the hard elements and the issues like uh, how is, 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 how such organizations, like the one which we're dealing with, because this is an insurance, how, how are they organized in terms of the industry best practice? The structures, they must do an assessment, the systems and procedures which are in place, the strategy on how these entities should deliver, but also look into the question of the skills. What skills the staff and management will need in such, in such an entity? And I think that we are going to do, and we have said, UDG must uh, initiate a process of employment, um, a very experienced company in these areas, in order to be able to deal with this matter in the long term. Because you might not know when is the next uh, uh, pandemic. I will, I will um, yes, uh, Honorable Apipleni, um very much concerned about the frustration of the workers. And I think uh, we, are, we also share your concerns. What interventions are we going to make? We want to be very careful that uh, we are not seen to be intervening illegally in terms of the labor disputes. Um, remember, we are government. Uh, remember, we are putting the law and those who are affected, the employer and the employee, must deal with the issues. If matters are being escalated, they must be taken to the CCMA to help them resolve the issues and so on. And, uh, but also we must equally, as much as we understand, appeal to all parties to resolve their problems amicably, but appeal also to the workers. If they go into illegal strikes, the employer is going to expel them, and the employer, in terms of the law, is going to say, we've well, followed the law. That's what they are going to say. And if they have followed the law, the employees, regardless of what the country, I mean, the, the, the grievance is, if people do not follow the procedures which are in the law, they are going to suffer. Therefore, the issue of wild cage strikes is very, very dangerous. And we'll be able to appeal to the workers uh, that if they feel that their issues are not being taken up, they must escalate the issues. We know about the Dagama. We've requested our office in the Eastern Cape to start dealing with those particular matters. Let me let me leave uh, this now to the commissioner and the COO. If there is any issue, I will come back. But unfortunately, Chairperson, I was uh, I planned up to three o'clock because I have another meeting at at, at that time. You will have to choose me. But if there are questions coming, I will take them. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. The Commissioner, please, uh, you have got up to half past two to, to respond to all the questions. Thank half past two. Thank you, Chair. Yes. I'm going to ask Judith to explain the, the formula, then I'll handle the rest of the questions in the remaining 25 minutes. Uh, Judith, just explain the formula quickly. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, maybe just to come to the calculation, just to illustrate the principle, I'm just going to use an example and I'm, I'm just going to try to go step by step just to understand the principle and in terms of how we come to the amount of what people get to benefit. 
Now, in terms of what we pay, there are about four elements that we look at. One of the key things that plays a role there is the lockdown period of what the employer is applying for. So, for an example, when the employer apply, when they put in their individual employee, uh, what they are required on the system is for the employer to indicate the lockdown period is applying for. So, for an example, if you are applying for May and you are applying for Judith, for an example, the employer will have to say, I'm applying for Judith for the 1st of May until the 31st of May. So, it means in this example, it means we have to pay Judith for the full month. So, that's one element that we need to look at. If the employer comes and say, I'm applying for Judith uh, 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 from the 1st of May to the 15th of May, it means what we're going to pay to Judith is two weeks. And that in in terms of the amount of money, because for someone who apply for lockdown period of a month, will not get a similar amount with a person who's applying for lockdown period for two weeks. That's number one. And then the other one that we take it into account is the IRR uh, that was indicated in the first directive that the minister signed in March where we apply the IRR in terms of the UI Act, which is between 38% and 60%. But I will illustrate that further. So that's the second element that we take into account. The other issue we take into account with the calculation is the minimum wage, uh, which in the directive, I think, uh, when Minister was taking that into account, one of the key things he indicated at the time that people must not get less than 3,500. Because at the time, uh, 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 what minister was looking at the impact uh, uh, that the employees are facing in this period and taking into account that there are employers that were not complying in terms of the minimum wage. And that is why it was indicated uh, in the directive. So we also take that into, amount, into account. Also in the directive, there is also an indication on the one on uh, where it indicates to say we need to top up. Uh, what it indicates in the directive, it says, when you take into account the amount that UIF is going to pay, you also take into account any salary that the employer could be paying people during lockdown. Together, those amount must not be more than the salary that this person normally will get. So if I need to illustrate this, making for an example, so let's say an uh, employer is applying for an employee and the normal salary of this employee is 4,000 rent. And the employer applies for this employee for a lockdown period of a full month. So the employer come and say, I'm applying for Judith, her salary is 4,000 rent. And I'm applying for Judith from the 1st of Sorry. May to the 31st of Sorry, May. Judith. Sorry, Judith. I'm told by IT yes. that uh, you you must switch on your. They can't see your face and on. Okay. On TV, can the you switch video. on your? Video? Yes. Okay, I did check. Am I visible now? Can I yes, continue? Uh, yes, okay. continue. Okay. So the second element, so in this example, then the employer says he's applying for this employee. The salary is 4,000 rent. Uh, the employer also indicate that he's applying for a lockdown period from the 1st of May to the 31st of May. The other, what the employer need to indicate is in this lockdown period, is he paying the employee a salary? So in the spreadsheet, there's a provision for employer to indicate salary during lockdown. So let's say in this example, the employer says, no, I can't afford to pay any salary. So under salary during lockdown, the employer will provide zero in that. And then the last element is the one of the top up. So when we do the calculation, what we're going to do, we're going to take the salary that the employee normally earn, which is 4,000 rent. Next is to say, what, what is the period that the employer applying for in the lockdown period? 1st of May to the 31st of May, so it's a full month. So we know that we're paying this person for 30 days. 
So when we pay this person for the 30 days, it means there's no need for us then to get the daily rate because it's already computed into the full month. But if this person was claiming for two weeks, we're going to take what we're supposed to pay for a month, and then we're going to determine the daily rate, and it was going to tell us what we need to pay for two weeks, taking into account the daily rate. But in this example, let's say it's for a full month. So we're going to take the 4,000, we're going to apply the IRR, and remember the IRR, how it works is the higher the salary you earn, the lower the percentage of, uh, of the IRR apply, the lower the salary you earn, the higher percentage of the, of the IRR you earn. What does it mean in principle? For someone who works, uh, who earn 2,000 rent, because the IRR is between 38% and 60%, we will apply for an example, I'm just making an example, we will apply 60% because the salary is 2,000 rent. But if this person ends at 10,000, then the IRR applicable will be 38% because of the higher the salary. So that's the principle of the higher the salary, the lower the percentage of the IRR, the lower the salary, the higher percentage. So let's make an example in this instant. I'm just making this for illustration. So if it's 4,000 rent, let's say for an example, we're going to apply 60% in terms of the IRR. It will mean this person for a full month, we need to pay this person 2,400 because we took the 4,000 and we apply the IR 60% and this person is supposed to get 2,400. Now, the next principle is what is also in the directive is no one must get less than 2,500. And if we say no one must get less than 2,400, I mean 3,400, sorry, now, when we do the calculation, this person is earning, is going to get, is supposed to get 2,400. The second question is, is the employer paying any salary during lockdown? Meaning that principle of a top up, do we need to apply? But in this instance, because the employer said he's not going to pay anything, it means the top up doesn't apply. So in this instance, it means instead of paying 2,400, because it's less than 3,500, the system is automatically going to take this 2,400 and the employee will get 3,500, which is the minimum wage. So let's take a similar example, another the same person or another person, but let's say the same salary. The person earns 4,000 rent, but let's say in this period, the employer says, uh, I was not able to afford to pay the full salary. However, I paid this person 2,000 rent, meaning I couldn't pay this person the full amount of what he normally gets with is a 4,000 rent. And that's what the employer is applying. Same principle remains the same. So for this example, I'm not going to change anything. So what are we going to do on this one? It means we first going to do the calculation again, 4,000. We're going to apply the 60%. This person is supposed to get 2,400. But then now in this one, we have to take into account the 2,000 that the employer is paying. So the employer says, I'm paying this person 2,000 rent. So if it pays him 2,000 rent, in terms of what we're supposed to pay as UIF, is 2,400. When you take 2,400 and you take the 2,000 that the employer has paid, this employee is going to get 4,400. And 4,400, it's more than the salary he normally gets because his normal salary is 4,000 rent. Now that section in the act of top up now come because that section says what the employer is paying and what UIF pay must not be more than the salary that this person on a normal basis, he supposed we could have been getting as a salary. So in this instant, we're not going to pay the 3.5. Because the employer has paid 2,000 rent, we're not going to pay the 2,400, but we're going to pay 2,000 rent. Because when you take the 2,000 rent of UIF and you take the 2,000 rent of the employer, it means the employee received the full 4,000 salary, which is what he qualifies for as a normal salary. And the reason behind this was, in terms of this principle, we were following the directive that were in the, uh, 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 but what was also key here was, 
During COVID period, employees must not get more than what is their salary that their uh, employer has been paying them during the COVID period. Thank you, Chair. So I try to go slow with the example just to explain the principle of the calculation and why you'll find in instances where people earning the same salary, but in some instances, they don't get the same amount. Now, maybe just to add before I conclude on the calculation, what we have picked up that has been a problem in this process is, remember, the, the, the lockdown period is provided by the employer. The salary of the uh, employee is provided by the employer during the application. What is the employee paid during lockdown period? It's provided by the employer. So we had many instances after we've calculated and we've paid the amount, the employer comes back to us and say, I've made an error. This person was not paying him a salary of 2,000 rent. So for me to put the 2,000 under salary lockdown, it was a mistake from our side. So that's when now the employer come and query uh, in terms of the amount we have already paid. But what we have also seen is there were other instances where the employer could have done their own calculation because the calculator was out. It was put even in the website. But what we are picking up is they were not applying the principle of top up and minimum wage correctly. So for an example, an employer could have already done a calculation to say they, they are going to take the salary of a person and say this is what the person uh, was supposed to get. So. Judith, I think you've covered the, the main okay. uh, areas of the calculation. I Principal, okay. The, All right. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Let me shoot straight to the questions that are remaining. Uh, I think, Chair, let me start here as I answer the questions. Um, the, the pandemic has no doubt uh, hit all of us by surprise. And there were instances where we did indeed drop the ball. There's no doubt about that. Um, the number of emails that we've received, there are indeed some of the emails that we could not attend. Uh, in the main, Chairperson, if you think about it, URF uh, took, took over the challenge of the COVID tests um, in the midst of doing our normal work. So we didn't really increase capacity, but we took over the COVID tests where we've paid over 4.6 million South Africans and with over 500,000 companies applying. I think, Chair, I cannot uh, uh, sit in this committee and say we didn't drop the ball in some instances. And I'm here to say, yes, we did drop the ball in some instances due to the magnitude and also the nature of the pandemic in that you needed to have fewer staff in your offices. You needed to use technology to execute this work. And hence, uh, we've given it our best shot, Chair, and uh, having been able to pay 27 billion rents in eight weeks is, is an unthinkable feat that we're able to achieve in, in the midst of uh, the difficult issues. Uh, moving swiftly, Chair, in my next 12 minutes, <coughs> uh, normal benefits has been put on hold, Chair, I did indicate earlier. We have not put on hold our normal benefits. In fact, I did mention earlier, Chairperson, that um, every every year, URF process about 700,000 ordinary benefits per year. And just this quarter alone, we've already processed over 500,000, which is more than 70% of our annual processing. So whilst we're processing COVID, we process more than 500,000 ordinary benefits within the same time. So we never stopped processing our ordinary benefits to an extent that we've already paid 3.1 billion rands. So ordinary benefits continue to be, pay, to be paid. We've gone to an extent of even <coughs> relaxing some of the requirements. Ordinarily, people will have to come to the labor centers to sign continuation form. For the, for the three months during the lockdown, we, we, we've, we've, we've relaxed that, that requirement such that if your claim had been approved already, you, you didn't have to come to the labor center to apply or to complete the continuation form. We'll just drop you an SMS or we'll process your claim as normal. So, and hence that explains why we have to, we've been able to process over uh, more than half a million claims in just one quarter, when ordinarily we process 700,000 in one year. Bank verification, Chairperson, when is this going to be in place? Um, this control, we started with it 
way when we started the process. We just added validation and validation has been implemented immediately for all the payments that we are going to be doing now. We're introducing validation. When we go live with June on Monday or over the weekend, the validation process will also be part of the solution. Uh, 75 cases in, in <coughs> my apology, investigated against uh, the 1 million or the 500,000 um, that has been processed. Chair, these two variables are not linked to each other. We have processed over 500,000 applications from companies. From the 500,000 that we've received, we've only received 75 fraud cases that have been reported, and we did break it down on the different natures of these um, fraud cases. Um, 16 of them have been concluded, and we did indicate that in the three cases, arrest is imminent. It will be happening in the next few days. And as, as arrest happens on that one particular case, it's going to affect every other linkage that it has. Whether it's, 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 it's within UIF or is at the company, when the arrest happens, it's going to affect every single person who's affected. And I think the minister did touch on that. Um, the first thing he said to us when he joined the department is he's not going to tolerate corruption, and we are not going to tolerate corruption either. To an extent that we've appointed a forensic investigator independent of our risk team so that they can independently investigate these cases, hand them over to the hogs so that we also um, continue with the independence of the investigation so that we don't compromise the investigation and interfere with the outcomes. <coughs> um, Yes, I've touched on if an employee is found guilty chair, we are going to be taking steps against such employees. Uh, in terms of how much money is left, we've already spent um, about 27.8 billion rands. That leaves us with about 12.2 billion rands left to pay for the rest of the month of May and, uh, and the month of June. But what we need to emphasize, the minister has made a commitment that we are committed to the 40 billion rands. We are committed to the three months. So we'll pay for April, May, and June. It may mean, as the minister said already, that we may have to go and borrow from other pockets of our investment or the portfolio in order for us to meet our three months obligation. That's the that's the matter that we are prepared to do uh, to make sure that we still cover the three months that we've committed to. <coughs> uh, we are in discussion, uh, chairperson and members, about those sectors that may not come back uh, when the economy whereas the economy opens. We are discussing at NetLeg with our social partners on what other options are available or that can be explored. Uh, right now, in as far as COVID is concerned, uh, members and chairperson, uh, UIF is in a tight corner. We, we are already going to go beyond the 40 billion rands. We anticipate that there will be more people who may lose jobs as a result of the COVID pandemic. And as a result, it means UIF will be under pressure in terms of paying for ordinary benefit, but also intervening in the economy to make sure that people go back to work as quickly as possible. If you recall, the Portfolio Committee approved uh, about a year ago, Section 5D of the UI Act, that UIF will fund the retention of um, work, the retention of contributors into employment or the re-entry of these contributors into employment. And, and that's one of the areas that uh, post the, the, the COVID-19 tears payments our focus shifts towards uh, funding retention and a re-entry of our contributors back into employment. <clears throat> because the survival of UIF depends entirely on people going back to work and continuing to contribute. Even the economy depends on that chairperson. So that's one area that, uh, as, as we conclude this chapter of, of the funding, we'll be moving into that area of the funding chair. Um, in terms of making the, the portal accessible, one of the uh, big break, breakthrough that the minister asked us with was the zero rating of the online platform. That zero rating enabled the online portal that UIF uses for COVID benefit, U filing, and any other UIF related online platform to be free. It doesn't cost you any data to, to visit this site because Vodacom has entered into an agreement with UIF to make those uh, facilities free of charge at no cost to data for the applicants. And that's the attempt, chairperson uh, uh, and members, that the department has made in order to make sure that these instruments remain accessible during these difficult times of COVID. 
Chairperson, I'm going to send uh, an email after the meeting with the, the, the people who are going to be the, the ones responsible for, for the portfolio committee's inquiries. Uh, there's an email that I've already set up. It's called uic.enquiry at labor.gov.za. But I'll share that email, Chair, after the meeting so that members can have the email address where they can send their inquiries to. And I'll also set up a team of about four people who are going to look into all the queries that will be emanating from the portfolio uh, committee. Uh, I think I did touch on the paid versus normal, that we've continued to pay our normal benefits, uh, members. We have not stopped, and we expect that the numbers are going to increase as the as the, the economy opens and other uh, other companies or sectors are not able to, to go back. Uh, part of our intervention, Chair, to, to make sure that uh, we are able to deliver on the benefits that were due was our relationship with Harambi. Harambi was able to help us with um, over 500 call center agents. In the beginning, we could not um, receive all these calls that were coming through, especially given that there were over 500,000 companies that were calling through, employees calling, organized labor calling. Our capacity to handle such calls was found wanting. And the minister and the department, we never shut away from owning up to that uh, shortcoming that we had. And Harambi came into play at uh, Chairperson with over 500 uh, call center agent, a uh, call center uh, technology that helped us for the past three months to be able to receive calls, to respond to queries, uh, such that uh, our drop rate uh, improved from 40% to 1%. They've even gone to an extent of receiving over a million calls in, during this period of the pandemic. And the relationship continues even for July and for for August, September, the, as a department, we are looking into uh, creating a centralized call center for the department that is much bigger, much wider, that will be able to, to stomach the number of calls that are coming through. In terms of the, the sector specific, like your taxi, domestic tourism, one of, one of the key instruments that the minister drive from day one was how do we bring the bargaining council on board for each sector, such that we ensure that the bargaining council takes ownership of the process. The one success area that we've had through this bargaining council was uh, with the, the tourism uh, uh, bargaining council, where the, the tourist guys, some of them who were struggling with compliance, but through the process of using the bargaining council and through the Ministry of Tourism, were able to, to zero in on some of the problems and make sure that the application process is simplified for the, the tourist guys through uh, that, that sector. Even now, uh, Chairperson, one of the things that we did um, in, in the last directive that the, the minister issued was to change the definition of a worker, such that those employers that had not registered and a, a, and a worker would have been compromised and not benefit. We converted that, that language such that it enables domestic workers who may not have registered their domestic worker or they may not have registered themselves to be able to apply for the domestic worker, and that also we're able to pay these workers in the process. Uh, employees not paying over what is uh, what is due to the employees, the chairperson, as I reported in the, in the investigation, and follow the money. This is one of our key focus areas that we are driving through the follow the money and the investigation. We have even employed a property company. One of their roles is to do data analytics of companies that has been paid and how far they've gone in terms of payment. As, as we drive towards making sure that people do get the money finally that was intended for them. Uh, Chairperson, the, the focus of the Auditor General in the main, I almost forgot your question, Chair. The, the focus of the Auditor General is to, is to follow every single COVID-19 process that was undertaken by URF. Whether it's supply chain, whether it's paying of tears, whether it's appointed of, um, interns or appointed offices provider, anything that the UIF did, even to buy sanitizers, they're auditing every single thing that the UIF did in as far as the pandemic is concerned and buying anything that is related to the COVID-19 tests. Chair, you raised two uh, critical questions about, uh, this, uh, this is my last minute, Chair. You raised two critical questions about how to avoid double payment and 
has a system been geared such that it can pick up someone who has been dismissed or who has been on maternity leave? I think one of the members did raise a similar question. I thought I'll just uh, club them together when I respond to yours. Chair, one of the control measures that we introduce as URF is the use of the ID number to track um, the benefit status of each applicant. If a company applies for a thousand employees, each, every, each and every single ID is tested against our database. First, we check if this employee is declared on our database. Second, we check if this employee is receiving any of our other benefits. Be it maternity, be it ordinary, or be it sickness benefit, we check against those. We go to an extent of checking if the benefit they are receiving, um, what is the variance between what they are receiving now and what they would have received um, against COVID. Those are some of the control we've put, such that we eliminate as far as possible people double dipping and receiving an ordinary benefit on one hand and receiving a COVID test benefit on the other. Uh, thank you, Chair. Back to you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner, and, uh, and, and, and your team. What I will allow then, members, is, is, is the second round. And in the second round, you'll have to be, you'll have to bear with me. I'll have to be a bit strict. It's going to be one question per member, a pointed critical question. The rest of the questions we will have to write, the, write and send them to the department, either for the attention of the minister, the attention of the DG, and the attention of the commissioner. And in that, we'll put a time frame because I don't want us to finish without our questions being asked, being, being responded to. So that's why I'm saying it must be one question, pointed question, and I'm then going to, to open up uh, that uh, for members to, to, to do. Can I get an indication? Thank Dana? you. I do have a question. Dana, Dana as well, please. Honorable, Honorable Dana, Honorable Begram. Uh, Honorable Montini. Cardo. Honorable Cardo. Noncele. Pointed questions. No preambles. No uh, three questions in one question. I know members can do that. In particular, uh, the elder Michael, don't smile. Probably Dana. Thank you, Chair. Now, this is just a follow up on one of the questions that I asked already, and I apologize if I missed the answer. Um, I just want to know when the specific verification of bank details was introduced into the system. Honorable Begram. Hey, Madam Chair, my question consists of 11 parts. Now, I'm only joking with you. I, I write, and the Minister said we must write and raise our complaints with the Commissioner uh, where as soon as we receive them. I, I send about 100 of those complaints a day on to the Commissioner. He can confirm that uh, if he wishes. Uh, but of those complaints we send in, we get approximately one third get responded to. Um, I know that he's understaffed and I know he's under pressure and I sympathize, uh, but is it going to help to carry on sending these requests in? Let me know. Thank you. Honorable Cado. Uh, thanks, Chair. I just wanted to reiterate my question about the uh, personal information data breach that took place. Uh, when June applications were open. I didn't get a satisfactory answer to my question. What is the UIF going to do to make sure that such a breach doesn't happen again and has been approached by any employers who are wanting to take legal action for the breach that did occur? Thank you. Honorable Nonsele. Chair, Chair, I've raised questions to the commissioner and the commissioner has not responded to them. Can I request that he responds in writing to my questions? Because he has not responded to a single one. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you, Honorable Nonsele. Any other questions? Oh, sorry, 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 Honorable Nonsele. Sorry, sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that don't be mal, uh, no, 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 very arrogant because uh, I think the way he answers these questions, and I even heard him on SAFM. We have lost you. Honorable Chuaku. Honorable Chuaku. My, my, are you still with us? Yes, I think. That was a mungue and it's fine. Okay, my, my, my last question to the commissioner is that they are, we have received complaints. I don't know whether this question was asked differently, but you'll, you'll, you'll indicate. They are young people that have been, uh, that have applied for 350 grant. grant, 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 grant. And when they were then the school, they were told that they are, they are in your system. Uh, they are getting UIF and it's 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 alleged that majority of them in fact all of them are not getting that i don't know whether you have been informed by the department of social development if you have been informed can you please give us the response if not can i request that you make that as a follow, uh, to to follow up that with the Department of Social Development. Thank you. Can you respond? Um, yeah. Is there somebody who's speaking? It was, it was me, Chair. Sorry, it was the, it was Honorable Chuaku. I, I just had a problem with that. that. I'm sorry, Chair. Sorry, sorry, man, I had a problem with the net, network where, where, where I am. So what do you want to, do you want to ask to, to reflect again on your question? Uh, yes, um, uh, uh, Chair. Um, uh, yeah, it was just uh, very quickly in terms of uh, in terms of just making sure that the calculation from Utu Judith it gets you know uh, publicized with the example so that we don't get confused with the calculation. And the commissioner can be please relax, calm down. We are going to call him a lot because I heard him on the public, uh, you know a platform dismissive not being patient so i would appeal to him to just relax and uh, because we are we are facing people who are in a distress and we need answers we're going to call him and uh, and we appreciate the email that is going to give us that the, as, as the members uh, we must be you know we are going to send all our queries so we actually appreciate that and if you can maybe by the end of this meeting send the members that email where we are going to be able to contact the people directly from the department so that this issue of the COVID-19 tests is sorted out once and for all. Thank you very much. Honorable members, uh, Honorable Gabane, are you still with us? Yes, sir, I'm here. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Chairperson, uh, for this opportunity. One is going to start by um, um, welcoming the responses from the commissioner and the team, as well as, as our, our honorable minister, Chair. However, Chair, one is noting that some of the questions that members have raised were not responded to. 
My first proposal, Chair, will be that um, the responses on those questions yeah. that were not responded to should be circulated to all members um, in writing, Chair, <coughs> as honorable as already indicated or proposed in the meeting. Secondly, Chair, um, looking at the magnitude of the problems that the entity is currently facing, as well as the challenges, my submission to the portfolio committee is that, Chair, we should mandate the chairperson of the portfolio committee to liaise with the house chairperson uh, to take the possibility of the committee uh, 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 of um, perhaps conducting an oversight in the UIF so that <clears throat> we'll be talking about issues that we know of rather than relying to the reports that they are presenting before us. I think that will actually assist us in um, uh, possible coming up with some of the possible solutions, as well as which will enhance our oversight and monitoring the implementation of those possible solutions that will then recommend after the oversight. That's my submission to the PC. That's my proposal, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Honorable Honorable Nkabane. There's a proposal put forth by Honorable Nkabane. Can I get a, a second to that? Uh, Honorable Hermans. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, greetings to the members and all in the meeting. Honorable Chairperson, I would like to second the move made by Honorable Ngabane. Also, just an addition to say, when the Chairperson is checking on that, there's an issue that was raised by the Commissioner, the issue that the staff have been scaled down. We know that in our labor centers, we don't have the full complement of the staff as they are facing them in coming, the, the, the employees coming to work. We need also to check into that and say, if we are going there, we are not going to expose them or be exposed uh, to, 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 to infections or whatever. Just to take the measurable precautions before going for, for that oversight. But I think in whatever that we are doing, we need to have the first-hand information and be able to, when we are talking about these issues, to direct them being informed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Hermans. Commissioner, can you please uh, respond to the last bench of, of questions that have been asked? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, let me start by apologizing. I, I, I missed some questions. I realize now as I'm looking on my notes. I'll, sub, I'll make a submission by Monday, Chair, on all the questions. And also, uh, with respect to the calculator, Chair, it, it's on our website, but what we'll do also after this meeting when we share the email address of, the, of where the inquiries will be sent, we'll also attach the calculator with examples, so that at least members has the <coughs> has sight of the calculation. Uh, the 350 grant, yes, we had discussions with um, social developments um, about three times already now about the data that they are using. In, in the beginning, they requested the full population of the URF data. Uh, which we did indicate that it might be problematic because the full population has everyone who has claimed for URF, whereas the population of only active uh, claimants in our system right now is more reliable and it can give you a better feel of who qualifies and who doesn't qualify. So last week we met uh, social development with our ICT guys <coughs> and uh, we'll be giving them the data of active claimants which then make more sense because all the active claimants uh, should not be re requesting uh, 350 from social government. As at, at that point in time, they're getting benefits from UIF. Uh, 
the, the bank verification chair, it was introduced right in the beginning of the process. The bank validation will be introduced um, when we when we go live with June, which is happening over the weekend. That we did verification, but now we're introducing further validation now. At, uh, as Judith, as the CEO mentioned, at the company level, to include even the ownership, the type of account, so at least we can sign off and know for sure who, um, who is the owner. <coughs> uh, I take the, 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 the comments by Honorable uh, Joaku uh, Chaperson. Uh, I apologize if I've come across as arrogant. Uh, my humble apology, there was no intention on my part, Chair, to come across like that or to be dismissive to members of the public who who are desperate for the services offered by UIF. It was never my intention, Chair. I'll, I'll look into that so that it doesn't happen again. Uh, in, in terms of data <laughs> bridge, Continue, in Commissioner. Terms of data, Okay, in terms of data breach, Chair, we have not received any uh, legal action taken against UIF. The ICT team has also assured me that there was no data leakage that happened as a result of the system glitch we have, like we had last week. And all the challenges has been closed. We are testing again today. We are testing again tomorrow. We are not going to rush to go live. We'll most likely go live on Sunday. Uh, late, uh, latest Monday, or, or at least Sunday midnight, just to make sure that we close all uh, these challenges that we, we had encountered. In the main, the issue that we were struggling with was the the load balancing, that we had more people applying last week uh, at one go, that the, the sessions uh, tended to be collapsing because of the number of people that were accessing the system at that point in time. But the, more servers has been added. We're adding two more servers over this weekend because people panicked, thinking that uh, we were closing last week for April, May, and June, and that was not the case. We are not closing for April, May, and June. We are still open and will continue to process until every single application we have received has been processed. Uh, Honorable Pagkheim, we will improve on our responding uh, to you. I think the challenge that we've had at this stage is each case requires us to investigate and to check what exactly is going on. And as we're, as we're investigating, it takes a bit long, but we'll improve on a turnaround time to respond to the inquiry that has sent. I think, Chair, the, the other ones, member said I must respond in writing to the other questions that I have not answered. I'll do so, uh, Chairperson, over the weekend. Thank you. No, thank you very much, uh, uh, Commissioner. I think if you can go to the chat, you will see that there are some questions that have been asked by members, which I think is going to be very important that those are responded to. The members of the select committee, I have also chatted before we before we close, if the DM is still around, if the, the minister or the DM is still around, can they have their parting shots? Is the minister still around? Minister? No, Chair, all I can say is we are going to make a follow-up on all the issues raised. And the intention is very clear to improve our systems, to improve service delivery. As I've indicated, I've already instructed the DG to talk about a review uh, on the assessment of the organizational, uh, excuse me, architect, mm -hmm. to see if it's fit for the purpose. There are a lot of weaknesses which have been exposed by this particular period, and uh, that's more in the medium term which we're going to deal with. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. I think in, in a very challenging situation, it is, it's, it's always appreciated uh, when leadership acknowledges where there are some shortcomings, which we do appreciate that, Minister. And in, ask, asking, in us asking questions, 
it's not that we are not appreciating the work we want i want on behalf of the of both committees i do want to put it across that we do appreciate the work that is being done by government and in this instant we are talking about the sector which is led by you that yes you are doing a very good work i miss the challenges that are there and the issue of 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 unemployment i think we've raised something which is very important the issue of how then workers do take a center stage in some of the areas and fight for their rights and we have been one of the people that has always been saying that uh, unions must really be strong in this instance because if they are not they are then really going to be taken for granted by the employer so it's 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 is that is very important to be said the second thing what we think we well i think the commissioner has has apologized if she, if he has come across being arrogant but i think the the environment that they are working under is not is not a very easy if i may say but uh, if if members have observed that i think you you will then have to see and check where you are to improve all the questions that have been asked i think honorable nonsele was up front to say you have not responded to his questions please ensure that at least by monday he receives those i'm going to make a follow up on that and the emails the emails the calculation uh, table please circulate that to us uh, referring us to the website at times may may be a bit challenging but please do circulate the information because we are found by mem by, by communities day in and day out you know with me i don't hesitate minister they know i circulate them to the dg and to the commissioners in terms of the areas where whether compensation fund or uif i will after the meeting check with the powers to be which is the house chair for committees and check uh, the, the 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 possibility of the motion that has been seconded in terms of a a an oversight because truly and honestly speaking at times it's not that we don't trust what you are putting in front of us but at times we would like to really balance that with the physical observations in the areas uh, that you have you have you have outlined again thank you very much for the work if there is a need we will come back to you but we think for now uh, questions that have been of 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 great importance has been responded to but i think the minister has raised something very important which as members we must try to avoid i like what honorable aplain did of of pointing that it is a company in timbaza this thing of saying many people many people were please let's not let's not be general now this is a very serious challenge for us to be able to conduct our oversight and and make the department to account we are not to be general we are to to be pointed to point where the challenge is if it is in plomfontein in the labor center that is in this in the city center we must say that if it is in port elizabeth in the labor center that is in govenbeki we must say that so so that we are being seen as people that know what we are talking about i always become uncomfortable myself honorable minister when members are general when they are asking their questions i'm humbly requesting us honorable members to to desist to be general and be specific 
because we want things to be corrected. I want to thank uh, Honorable Chai and the, and, the, and the members of the select committee in the NCOP. Until we meet again, we miss each other. I hope uh, we will meet again before the end of the year. I hope so. But uh, we will continue in this fashion until we are told otherwise. Thank you very much. Our meeting is adjourned until we meet again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Jefferson. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.